right, good evening. Happy Wednesday to you. Some of you look like you've been through five days in the past three. I understand that statement, uh, but uh, it's hopefully this will be a chance for you to uh, rest and relax. And as we open up God's Word, get a chance to refresh and just renew yourself in Him this evening as we uh, study and we talk uh, uh, about our Lord and what He has done for us. And as we have a chance to worship together tonight, um, I want to... Remind you, doesn't matter, based on our topic, whether you're male or female, we are all called to serve the Lord, uh, and uh, we are all called to stand firm for Him and stand on the promises that are found in His Word, not in what man tells you or what other people tell you, but the thing you can take with you day in and day out is what God's Word says and the promises that are found in that. So let's stand together this evening, and let's start with that by standing on the promises. Let's sing together. Standing on the promises of Christ my King Through eternal ages let His praises ring Glory in the highest I will shout and sing Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing, standing I'm standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises that cannot fail, when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God I shall prevail, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises I cannot fall, listening every moment to the Spirit's call, resting in my Savior as my all in all, standing on the promises of God, standing. Standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your promises that are found in your holy word. Father, the promises that that give us hope each and every day, the promises that share with us new mercies that you uh, bestow upon us each and every day, the promises of uh, your soon return, the promises of forgiveness, the promises of uh, your um, refuge, the promises of your shelter, the promises of your protection, the promises of your healing. And Father, all of these things come together uh, in these 66 books uh, to form your holy word. And I pray, Father, we don't take that lightly, but that we treat your word and we take it and we digest it and we place it in our heart so that we can live out the principles that are spelled here in your word, so that we can share with others a hope that can only be found through you and your son, Jesus Christ, and what he has done for us on the cross. So Father, tonight, may we take hope May we take refuge and shelter and renewal and forgiveness, and may we be able to put that in, uh, in terms where we can share with others when we come across, uh, when they come across our path. And when we are given that opportunity, may we step boldly uh, forward to be able to share uh, the hope that we have in you and that is promised us in your word. So tonight, Father, uh, work in our hearts. May we be receptive to your word, and may we uh, follow through on what it is you have called us and challenged us to do. In thy name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you, Derek, and welcome to another Wednesday night Bible study. If you have your Bibles, please turn to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and also be praying for me tonight. Uh, I've been fighting laryngitis so far this week. 
I have not run a fever. I have not lost a, a sense of smell or taste. So I don't think it's COVID. I think it's just good old fashioned laryngitis that probably means goldenrod or ragweed or something starting to bloom that usually does it for me. So pay attention. And if I lose my voice tonight, one of y'all can step up and finish up for me. But uh, tonight, tonight we want to talk about why do men hate going to church? Um, I recently received uh, an email with a book review from crosswalk.com called The Truth About Why Men Hate Going to Church. Uh, the book was written by uh, some fellow named David Murrah who worked uh, in the video production industry for over 30 years. He was also an elder in the Presbyterian Church. And as I understand elder, that means he was like a pastor uh, in, in the church. Uh, it was interesting the comments that followed because he said, I love God, but I hated going to church. Wait a minute, you're, you're a pastor? <laughs> if the pastor hates going to church, I can only imagine his congregation. But anyway, uh, I hated going to church. Sunday morning would find my body in the pews, but my heart was elsewhere. He summarized the problem by saying it's really the church's fault. Uh, the church ministries are geared for women, he says. The typical church is built around traditional feminine roles of caring for the sick, caring for children, singing, reading, and socializing. He said the things that guys are into, like strategic planning, sports, competition, and the like, these things are frowned on in the church. Church is supposed to be a warm, nurturing place where we hold hands and love each other, but the average Joe probably feels that he can connect better with God outside of the institution of organized religion. I've, uh, he said, I've talked with men who have profound experiences with God while they are out hunting or out on a boat on the water. And then while Mira offers lots of recommendations on how to fix this men hating to go to church problem, he recommends that pastors begin with sermons. He said, shorter is better. If I were going to plant a church, I would preach 10-minute sermons. Uh, also, men are visual learners, so the best thing is for a pastor to actually bring an object into the pulpit um, uh, whenever he speaks and preach concise sermons built around that object lesson. He said, a pastor who does that will have a church full of men in a few years. So, yeah, and no women, yeah. Uh, well, our Wednesday night question of the week is, will short sermons and object lessons help men love church? So anyway, uh, let's read a little scripture about this subject. I've asked you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, which incidentally was written by the Apostle Paul, who did not believe in short sermons, by the way. In Acts chapter 20, we're told that upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. Does that sound like a short sermon? Uh, it sounds like several hours worth, not just 10 minutes. But anyhow, if you'll look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, I think we get the crux of the problem right here. And that is, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Um, notice what Paul does here. He gives us the, the object lesson, I guess this fellow is asking for, and that object is the cross. And one of the main reasons that many men hate church is because our object lesson is the message of the cross. It's the preaching of the gospel, that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And it seems like foolishness to them, and it's boring, it's a waste of time, or to quote Mr. Murrah again, uh, or their bodies are in the pews, but their heart is somewhere else. And the question is, is why are some men so bored? Well, 1 Corinthians 1.18 tells us it's because they are perishing. They may not know it, may not cross their mind, but they are perishing. And what Paul is trying to say here is, in effect, they are lost. I remember back in the 1970s uh, when the late, great evangelist Billy Graham was in his heyday of preaching. He used to say in his sermons, I remember him saying it several times, that he believed that approximately 70 to 80 percent of church members were lost. Meaning they go to church, they go through the motions, they serve on committees, they do their duties, but at the end of the day they're not saved. They've not been born again. They don't have a personal relationship with Christ. And they do not love the Lord with all their heart, their soul, their mind, their strength. So the reason that some men maybe even the majority of men hate going to church is because they're not saved. And if they're not saved, then they do not have the indwelling Holy Spirit, and they do not have, as it says in Romans 5, 5, they do not have the love of God that is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So 
They do not have the love of God or the love for the Word or the works of God. But rather than dealing with this negative reality, rather than spending much time saying, well, why is it that Joe doesn't like to come to church? Uh, we decide that, uh, you know, and go through the thought process of maybe he's lost. Maybe we need to pray for him. Maybe we need to share the gospel with him. Maybe that will turn him on to the gospel. No, the modern way of ministry says we need to cater to these guys in hopes that if we become their buddy, then maybe at some point uh, Jesus will become their buddy too. And that's how church growth theology uh, works today. Uh, we're talking about some combination of the seeker-friendly megachurch or the affinity group church model. Uh, you probably heard of the seeker sensitive church. Basically the way those things are set up, and again, they, as far as crowds go, uh, they're doing very well. You can't argue with their success there. But their basic model is you go out in the community and you ask lost people who hate church, by the way, what should we change that would make them feel more comfortable in our church? Think about that. The church is going out and asking the world, what can we do in order to make you feel more comfortable while you're in our church? It's interesting because, you know what, I've never had a bar or a nightclub call me and ask how they could change to make me feel more comfortable in their bar. But here we do, we got the Church of Jesus Christ going out in the street and say, how can we sell out our theology so you'll feel comfortable in our church? A variation of this uh, seeker-sensitive church is the affinity group church. And a lot of churches are trying to do that these days. That is, you build a church around men with common interests. That's how you end up with a motorcycle church, or a cowboy church, or a lakeside church, or an RV camping church, or maybe a golfing church where you have 10-minute sermons before tea time. I don't know exactly how all these things work. And all this may sound good, and I remember studying all this in church growth classes and seminary, but you know, none of those things have a great track record of making great disciples of Jesus Christ. I remember about the time I came here, 2007, 2008, uh, Willow Creek Church, which is one of the first successful big mega churches up in the Chicago area. Uh, and I have to commend them for this. Uh, most churches, and probably including ours, really wouldn't want to do this. But actually do a survey of yourself where they brought in some consultants and began to ask people throughout the congregation how much they knew about the Bible, how much they knew about the Lord, their habits of discipleship, their spiritual disciplines and all these kind of things. And the church really got their feelings hurt because when they summarized it all, they said Willow Creek was very good at putting a crowd together, but they weren't making disciples of Christ. They didn't, the people are coming, they're enjoying the show, they're enjoying the service, but they're not growing in their relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, which kind of defeats the purpose. I think another reason uh, that this seeker-sensitive business doesn't work is because uh, the method is very similar to what we had back when I was in retail called bait and switch. It's where you advertise something on the radio, TV, or newspaper, and then when the customer gets in the store, you try to sell them something else. Uh, most customers don't appreciate it, and that kind of tactic doesn't last for long. And the same is true in church. You know, it's kind of like you, you, some of you men may have went to a wild game supper before. I know out in rural churches they try to do that, uh, have, have everybody bring in their, their squirrel and their duck and their coon and deer and all this kind of stuff. Uh, they, they bring in all that, and then they bring in some famous bass pro or some duck hunter, and he tells a few hunting and fishing stories and gets everybody all revved up, and then he tries to turn the conversation to Jesus in hopes that that same love and passion that these men have of the great outdoors is somehow or another going to translate into a love for Jesus. Folks, it doesn't work that way. You cannot trick men, you cannot trick women into loving Jesus. It just doesn't work. Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 2.1, he says, For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain, but we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God, for our exhortation or preaching did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit. In other words, we didn't trick anybody. But as we had been approved of God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests their heart. For neither at any time do we use flattering words or a cloak of covetousness. In other words, he didn't, he didn't do a bait and switch. He didn't do any tricks. He didn't try to do things to get guys to come and then try to sell them on Jesus once they got there. He told them, I'm telling you about the gospel. The Son of God came into this earth, and he came to offer us forgiveness of sin and everlasting life if you would believe. 
It didn't put any razzmatazz. It didn't, didn't try to put any spin on it. Just told it the way it is. See, Paul realized by experience also and from the Lord that you can't trick or coax or manipulate people into a close personal relationship with Christ. You cannot coax or manipulate people into the kingdom of heaven. So for a man or a woman to become a devout Christian, a faithful follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, there must be a change. According to Acts chapter 20 and verse 21, there must be repentance toward God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ or else that's never going to happen. You cannot just coax and cajole people into the kingdom of heaven. There has to be a change in their life. And when Jesus was witnessing to a powerful man named Nicodemus in John chapter 3, he didn't talk about hunting or fishing or golfing or the Atlanta Falcons. Jesus talked to him about eternity, talked to him about his future. He said, what happens when this life is over? Jesus said, I'll tell you what happens. You either enter the kingdom of heaven or you perish in a place called hell. And so Jesus didn't tap dance around the topic, didn't try to bait or switch or build a, you know, Nick, uh, some kind of relationship with him. He just said, Nicodemus, in order to enter the kingdom of heaven when this life is over, you must be born again. You must be born from above. You must be born of the Spirit. And then he takes pains to tell him what that means. And the only way this can happen, the only way you can be born again, is to put your faith in the Son of God. And who is the Son of God? Nicodemus It's the guy standing here talking to you. That's the only way that you enter the kingdom of heaven. Notice, when, when trying to, to use any outside source in order to try to pull him into the thing, he just go, gave him the reality is that once this short life that you have is over, you're going to go one of two destinations. Pick where that's going to be. And, of course, that's where uh, the Apostle Paul then takes off in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, if you still got your Bibles open. He really fires it up at this point, and I think it really answers our question about men uh, not enjoying their experience at church. He said, however, verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 6, however we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for if they had known it, then they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor entered into the heart of a man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit, through his Holy Spirit. For the Spirit searches all these things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of man except the Spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Now the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolish to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. See what he's saying here? One of the reasons that the natural man is bored in church and feels like his body is in church but his mind is somewhere else is because he does not have the Spirit of God in his soul. He doesn't have the Spirit of God in his inner being. But once you repent of your sins and receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, he gives you his Holy Spirit. And what does it say here in what we just read? The Holy Spirit gives you the mind of Christ. And once we have that mind of Christ, it changes the way we look at things. Look at verse 13. It says, we no longer look at things from a worldly perspective. We now begin to look at things from the Holy Spirit's perspective. We look at the world in a totally different way. For example, several of the Lord's 12 disciples, if you remember, were fishermen. And now again, even the guy who wrote the article, he let you know that fishing is a manly thing. It's a really manly thing, even though Laura always catches more fish than I do. But nevertheless, <laughs> fishing, fishing is a manly thing. But as David Murrah, uh, in his book about why men hate going to church, said that most men would rather be fishing, that they connect with God better on a boat, on the water, than they do in church. Well, with all that as background, so what did Jesus do? How did Jesus go about attracting these manly fishermen that he is fixing to call to be disciples? Uh, and Truth be told, I imagine they didn't like to go into temple very much either. So what did Jesus say? Okay, boys, let's just stay out on the lake. 
and let's commune, commune with God any way it feels good to you. Uh, we'll have a little devotional, making sure it don't go over 10 minutes, and we'll use a fishing pole as an object lesson, and let's just call it church. Is that the way Jesus called his disciples? No, he said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. I'm fixing to change your trade. You're fixing to come off the water, we'll fill you with the Holy Spirit of God, and now all of a sudden you're going to be a disciple who makes disciples. You're going to be someone who catches men, catches women, and tells them about the Lord Jesus Christ, and they become disciples who in turn make disciples. Well, how did the disciples go about making these other disciples? Well, they made disciples by following the old synagogue method that ultimately became the New Testament church method just as well. Uh, what you do is you meet people in the marketplace. You meet people in your family, among your friends, where you go to school, where you go to work, all these people you come in contact with. And what do you do after you meet them? You invite them to your gathering. And when they come to your gathering, they're going to see men, not just women, but men are going to be praying, they're going to be singing hymns, they're going to read and interpret and apply the Bible to their lives. And for those men who are interested enough to believe in the Lord Jesus and become a faithful follower of Christ, you will baptize them. And then guess what? Then they become a disciple who becomes a fisher of men who goes and makes other disciples. And by the way, do you realize that model is how the church has made it 2,000 years all the way up to us? It was passed along that same way there. Not, not out here trying to do crazy schemes in order to get people you know, trapped in your church. You went out, you led people to faith in Jesus Christ. They became faithful followers of Christ. You met together, you encouraged one another, you went back out and carried out the Great Commission. That's the way it works. Another thing we need to clear up from this guy's article is church is not feminine work, by the way. Church is disciple work for both men and women. Uh, another thing, you know, he said men love strategic thinking. Well, we don't need another strategy in the church. The Lord left us with a strategy called the Great Commission, and that is go ye therefore and make disciples of the nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even until the end of the age. That is our strategy. That's the problem now with the church, is you go to all these preacher meetings and we get into strategic thinking and we sit there and we wordsmith and come out with mottos and all this kind of stuff. When you get through with it, the mission of the church is the Great Commission. And just we need to get with it. So again, we don't need men coming up with other strategies. Also, we don't need a bunch of worldly object lessons. The Lord has given us our object lessons. We have a cross and an empty tomb. That's our objects. It tells us about Romans 6, 23. The cross tells us that the wages of sin is death. The empty tomb proves that the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So we got the object lesson taken care of. Also, uh, caring for the sick is not just women's work. In James chapter 5 and verse 14, Is anyone sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. What gender were the elders of the church in the New Testament period? Men. I would say, so apparently men are supposed to be able to care for sick as well. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Also, praying is not just women's work. 1 Timothy 2.8, the Apostle Paul writes, I exhort that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. And if the men somehow or another not have holy hands that they can lift up, then guess what? They need to repent. Repent of their sins so they can lift up holy hands and pray before the Lord. Also, singing is not just women's work. In Acts chapter 16, verse 25, we find out that Paul and Silas had been jailed in the Philippian jail. Why? Because of preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it says, Long about midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto the Lord, and the prisoners heard them. And then a wonderful miracle happened out of that. But I just wanted to prove one thing, that men can sing, right? Yeah, there we go even though they may not like to. And he goes ahead and says, Colossians 3, 16, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So yes, both men and women are supposed to sing the praises and reinforce those verses in our brain by singing good hymns. Also, teaching children is not just women's work. Ephesians 6 says, And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up or rear them or teach them in the training and admonition of the Lord. 
And brothers and sisters, if ever there was a time when we need men to be teaching children on how to grow up and be godly men and women, it is now. Amen. Thanks to the feminist movement of the 1970s where radical socialist women were chanting, a woman needs a man like a fish needs a bicycle. Men were standing by listening to the culture instead of listening to the Word of God. And here we are 50 years later, and we're watching the disintegration of the American culture uh, because of this fatherless worldly wisdom in our culture where from our children who are in grade school all the way up to our justices on the Supreme Court, we cannot tell the difference between a man and a woman. And instead of our youth seeking God's will from God's word for their life and praying and asking God, say, Lord, give me some guidance about what I need to be when I grow up. Give me some guidance about who I should marry. Give me some guidance about where I should work. Give me some guidance about where I should live and raise a family. Instead of going through those, our children are medicating and mutilating themselves with this unscientific, unnatural, unbiblical transgender propaganda so that someday when these children get older and wiser and wishing they could have a godly spouse and children, it will be too late because their abused bodies will simply not allow it. Also, instead of our men following the course of our culture in this world, which defines manhood as the only difference between men and boys is the size and price of their toys, we need men who will follow Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord, who are willing to turn aside from the cares of the world and stand up, stand up for Jesus, which we just sung, in their homes, in their workplaces, and in their church. As Paul says, 1 Corinthians 16, 13, in the old King James, it said, Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit ye like men, and be strong. What's he saying? He's saying, quit messing around playing spiritual games and be brave, courageous men, and stand up in the spiritual battle of these last days and be counted. Peter Marshall, who was a chaplain for the United States Senate back in the 1940s, once prayed in the Senate, unless we stand for something, we shall fall for anything. And make no mistake, our nation is falling for anything. You scan the headlines today. Our doctors can no longer define a vaccine. Our Supreme Court can no longer define a woman. Our Southern Baptist Convention has appointed a committee to try to figure out what a pastor is. Our children don't know if they're a boy or a girl. Our military who used to fight communism, now they can't even recognize communism in their own chain of command. Our world leaders have forgotten God and they're trying to act like God themselves. In this day and age, our men do not need shorter sermons. One of the reasons I think that our churches are failing to influence the sinful culture around us is because of all the short sermons. The late great evangelist Leonard Ravenhill used to say, we have too many preacherettes preaching to, too, preaching too many sermonettes to too many Christianettes who are smoking their cigarettes. <laughs> I, th I think Ravenhill is trying to say the same thing that the prophet Hosea was saying 2,800 years ago. Hosea 4, 6, he said, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And the reason Hosea gives for people's lack of knowledge is poor preachers preaching short chicken soup for the soul sermons, preaching peace, peace when there is no peace, and failing to tell people and warn them that if they're living in sin and dying in sin, that judgment day is coming and you need to turn or burn and you need to uh, make your peace uh, prepare to meet your God. So no, men do not need shorter sermons. What men need to do is turn away from our electronic idols where we kill time watching news, sports, porn, and social media, and we need to get into God's Word and begin to live our lives accordingly. You know, years ago, I was pastoring a church in South Georgia, and I remember there was a man in his 70s. I went and visited him and talked to him about his soul, invited him to church. His daughter and her family were already in the church, his wife had recently joined the church, but he didn't seem very excited to see me, uh, nor did he really want to talk about the Lord, and he especially didn't want to talk about the church. So anyhow, I left him uh, thinking that that wouldn't, didn't work out too well. But I was surprised because in a couple of weeks, uh, he attended a Sunday morning worship service. Now, I could tell he was nervous. He didn't speak to anyone. And I kind of kept my eye on him while he was in the church just to see what his reaction was. And I could tell he was not loving the worship service at all. 
uh, because as soon as the church service is over, I mean, he slipped out the side door like a bullet without speaking to me or anybody else. What really surprised me, though, is he came back a couple more times, and he acted the same way. Again, he wouldn't speak to anybody, and as soon as the service is over, last, even before the last amen, he's already getting out of the church. Uh, matter of fact, he could have been the poster boy for a man who hated going to church. But one Sunday morning during the invitation, he came down the aisle with tears in his eyes and told me he needed to be saved. And I prayed with him. He received Christ. And we baptized him a few weeks later. And after his conversion, you could clearly see the change in him. And all of a sudden, he went from a guy who hated being in church, and it was obvious, to now he was a guy who loved coming to church. Matter of fact, he was there every time, you've heard us say, every time the doors were open, he would be there, and he'd stand around, and he'd speak to people, and he'd welcome visitors, and you could tell that something was going on there. Matter of fact, if I didn't know better, I would have thought he was one of those members that had been in church his whole life. He was that comfortable after he came to the Lord. You know, and every time I think about him, I think about him often, too, because um, I, I think of that old hymn, What a Wonderful Change in My Life Has Been Wrought Since Jesus Came Into My Heart. See, there's what's missing. That's why men and women hate coming to church. It's because there hadn't been that change because Jesus came into their heart. See, having Jesus in your heart will make a wonderful change in your heart concerning the church because we're told in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. He loved the church so much he was willing to go to the cross and die in order to make the church possible uh, so once you know Jesus, guess what? You learn to love his church too. It just goes together. Why? Because you love Jesus. He gives you his Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives you the mind of the Christ. And what was on Christ's mind? The church. He did all this for the church. So let's finish by answering our Wednesday night question of the week. Will short sermons or object lessons help men love church? No. But actually getting saved will. It'll make a remarkable change in their life. Uh, it'll cause men and women and boys and girls to love church, but most of all, it will cause them to love the Lord of the church, and his name is Jesus. So tonight as we close, let us make it our business not to try to reinvent church. That just aggravates me so much to go to preachers' meetings and, oh, we've got we to gotta change this, we've got to change that. We gotta... This church has made it, if you just faithfully trust the Lord, has made it 2,000 years all the way down to us by people just taking God's word leading people to faith in Christ, helping them become disciples who make other disciples. But for some strange reason, we're so intelligent now, we feel the need that we have to reinvent the wheel in everything, and that includes the church. So let's not uh, go ahead and reinvent church. Let's get busy with the business of praying for people who are lost, leading them to repent of their sins, and receive the Lord Jesus Christ, and then watch them grow in the love for our Lord and for His church. Amen? Amen? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we do live in a day when everything is being torn down. Everything that seems like more than a 20 years old has to be taken down now because this current generation is just so brilliant. They don't look back. They don't remember the proverb that says we're not to remove the ancient landmarks. Today we tear down the landmarks and move them outside the city. Lord, forgive us as a church for buying into these same philosophies of church growth theology, seeker friendliness, affinity, and all these other things that may help pack pews but doesn't necessarily create Christians. Lord, help us to get back to the old-fashioned way of leading people to repent of their sins, put their faith and trust in you, and allow you to change their heart, change their life for all eternity. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.